it's a pleasure to be here. I'm sorry I dodged you for eight years, uh, Doug, but it's good to be here now. And um, my disclosure, I've got a few con conflicts there, but nothing terrible. Uh, Winston Churchill said, men occasionally stumble over the truth, but most of them pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing had happened, right? <laughs> I'm hoping I'm not one of those guys so far, maybe. And here's another guy like that who doesn't run away from the truth. And he, Steve's been a real mentor to me. We've been hanging around together for about 20 years. And uh, we have this tradition of skiing uh, together at Whistler. He brings his family up and we get together and we have some meals and we ski. And uh, he blames me for breaking his rib once when he fell, trying to follow me down a steep slope. Uh, so this year he brought a guy up from Australia where there's no snow. And I think the plan was to slow me down. So we had Rod Taylor there. And the three of us had a nice visit and skied together. And Rod said, why don't you come and talk at this conference? And I said, well, you know, I don't know what to talk about. I don't have anything to talk about anymore. Everybody else is doing such a good job. Uh, how about the uh, global anti-meat conspiracy is kind of a joke? And he said, you're on. Okay, so that's the topic. Do you remember Ricky Gervais? And he did the monologue for the Golden Globes about three or four years ago. So, well, if you haven't seen it, it's one of the funniest monologues. And he kept saying... You know, he's insulting everybody and he kept saying, I don't care because I'm never going to get invited back anyway. So I'm going to probably insult a few of your sensibilities <laughs> here. Now, I think we're all, I assume when I'm in a crowd of low carb keto people that we've all taken the red pill. But just in case, if there's a few holdouts, I give you this little warning. <laughs> now, now, <laughs> now, uh, <laughs> Uh, it pays to be an early adopter, right? Uh, so, with that topic, suddenly I'm worried because I, I you know, what am I going to say? So I did what every enterprising college kid does these days. I asked chat GTP, <laughs> GPT, yeah, is there a global anti-meat conspiracy? Now, you have to be careful about this. Uh, not everybody's keen on this, all these AI new technologies. Nevertheless, I got an answer, and it was funny with chat GPT, it took a while for this answer to come out. It, normally it's fairly quick, and the answer was no. There's no global anti-meat conspiracy. Shocking, shocking answer. Uh, but then it, it elaborated a bit. It said, while there are certainly individuals and organizations that advocate reducing meat, and they all do it for their own different reasons and blah, 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 blah which is true. I think people have different reasons for avoiding meat. I can remember the day when I almost became a vegan. <laughs> In case you don't recognize her, that's Pamela Anderson, famous uh, vegan. Anyway, I texted that picture to my wife. It was at lunchtime at the office. And some of my patients said, oh, Pam Anderson's in the cafe around the corner. So I went over and she was very gracious and gave me a a selfie and I texted it to my wife and I got one back right away. What are you doing at Hooters? And, <laughs> and I said, I said, and then a minute later, is that Pamela? And I said, yes. And she went, oh, okay. Because she knew I had no chance, right? No chance. <laughs> Shortly after that, she married a guy older than me. Anyway. So one of the things that has been troubling me lately is that I'm constantly running into patients who tell me they're cutting back on red meat. And I always ask them why. And I get various somewhat vague answers. And I came across this uh, product of a survey, uh, this was in 2019, where people talk about their major reason why they're cutting back on meat. And on the left there is health. So 70% that's their main reason, 20% that's one of the reasons. So that's 90% of the people think it's healthy to cut back on red meat. Second to that is environment. People think it's better for the environment if they don't eat red meat. And then these other ones. But those are the two main ones. And I find that really interesting. So let's spin the clock back. The, this is not from Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. That is my 
grandfather and grandmother on their wedding day and my great uncle. Uh, I come from a background of Métis, which is one of the indigenous uh, populations in Canada. These people are Métis. And they lived in the far north where this is the, my grandmother's house where she raised nine kids. And um, everybody had diabetes. My gran both my grandparents developed diabetes. They died from the complications of diabetes. My grandfather had terrible al Alzheimer's as he got older. Um, and their kids, all their kids, my mother included, had type two diabetes. Uh, and this is in a tiny little community way up in the north where it gets extremely cold. This is my father, who's not uh, indigenous. He's German stock, Pennsylvania Dutch, uh, who uh, moved to Canada during the revolution because he didn't agree with the rebels. Uh, their family were United Empire loyalists, loyal to the British Empire. But anyway, he, he, this is him during World War II. He was an intelligence officer with Canadian Air Force stationed in the Far East. He was in Burma and India during the war. And then after the war, he, uh, he spent some time in post-war Germany and the destruction and the, you know, the, he, was, he was deeply affected by all that. And that's why he, when he came back to Canada, he abandoned society and went way up into the north to teach in a little one-room schoolhouse in this tiny little village. And that's where I was born. So that's me, and this photo is about 70 years old. Uh, and I, you know, spent a lot of time in my grandma's house, the one you saw in the picture, and we didn't, we weren't, let's say we weren't affluent. We lived a pretty, uh, you know, poor existence, actually. And my typical breakfast in those days was Kellogg's cornflakes with skim milk and lots of white sugar. And throughout my childhood and early years, this is the kind of food we ate, and this is the kind of food that I'm sure drove my grandparents and other relatives to their type 2 diabetes. The other reason I want to show you that picture is because one of my you know, vivid memories from childhood from that time was there was a traveling toy salesman who found his way up into this tiny little remote village and sold my mother on dinky toys. I don't know if you see dinky toys anymore, but they, they're these little miniature metal trucks and, you know, vehicles and things. And he told her they're indestructible. And in these little villages, any visitor gets invited in for tea. So uh, she bought some for me and off they went to have tea in the house. And that didn't sound quite right to me. So while they were in there, I lined them up on the doorstep and I took my father's hammer out of the toolbox and I smashed them all to bits. And, and I, I always remember the look on their faces as my mother <laughs> and this salesman came out to see these indestructible toys all smashed to bits. But this was part of my nature. If something didn't seem right to me, out comes the hammer. The other thing, the other thing is that I was an early adopter. And if you zoom in, you'll notice I'm playing with a MacBook Air laptop there. Anyway, <laughs> so... After I finished school in little northern towns in Alberta, I was expected to go to university because my father had had a university degree, but I, didn't, I wasn't interested in that. And part of the reason is because of James Bond and the Pink Panther. Because as a, as a young teenager, I saw these movies in, in the movie theaters in these little austere little bush towns. And it opened up my eyes to this wonderful world out there of adventure and beautiful women and fast cars and all this stuff. And I wanted to get from here to there. And I didn't see going to university as really necessary for that. M m maybe even a detour. So I went to work and I worked in construction in Northern Alberta in the petrochemical boom. Uh, I was a surveyor. This is what surveyors do. They lay out things. I worked on big projects. This is an aerial view of the tar sands. I worked on things like that. and. Uh, and then I eventually became skilled at driving uh, equipment like this. Um, and, and I loved it. And uh, I made lots of money and I didn't go traveling to exotic places. I wasted on fast cars, fast motorcycles, fast girlfriends. And uh, eventually, eventually I reached the point where I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't actually get fired, but I did make a career change. Uh, and uh, I'd been doing this for 10 years at this point. And I was a d 
do-it-yourself kind of guy. I would have a toolbox in the trunk of my car. I would fix it on the side of the road. I, you know, I like to be self-sufficient. And I came across this picture of this Russian doctor in the Antarctica who was taking out his own appendix. And I thought, that's the ultimate do-it-yourself guy there. <laughs> so I think I'll become a doctor and round out my you know, do-it-yourself capabilities. So we're going to skip ahead because <laughs> I, I became a doctor and I, you know, I had a varied career. I did family practice, trained in family practice, did that, worked in public health, was early, worked on AIDS early in the AIDS epidemic in Vancouver, which was kind of an, one of the epicenters, uh, got kind of sucked into the federal government uh, health bureaucracy, ended up in Ottawa with a senior job there, and um, then had my low-carb epiphany. Because in the course of all this, I neglected my own health and I developed florid type 2 diabetes. And it kind of hit me pretty hard when I kind of figured it out. First of all, how could you be so stupid? And secondly, this is serious, you know, it shortens your lifespan, your, your life expectancy. And my son was two at this point and God, I, I want to be around for him, you know, that kind of stuff. And so I stumbled, literally stumbled without any real knowledge or expertise into low carb. Because what I did, as soon as I realized I had diabetes, I stopped eating carbs. Because in my rudimentary understanding of diabetes and diet back then, carbs raise your blood sugar and I didn't want that, and at least until I could figure out which medications I should be on. And, well, you know the story, right? As soon as you cut carbs, everything gets better. And I made a really rapid recovery. I shed a pound a day for a month Everything got better, I felt better, and then I started looking back at the conventional approach to diabetes and I thought, that's not quite right, you know? So comes the hammer. So I had a number of epiphanies. The first one was that my diabetes could be put into remission by eliminating carbohydrates. The second one was that nobody else has seemed to notice this. I had worked in diabetic clinics. I was actually the camp doctor at the provincial diabetic kids camp for two or three years. Nobody had ever suggested this. Uh, and then I, I had a bit of a bully pulpit because I was still working in the health department and I would have opportunities to talk to large audiences and I started talking about it. And the nutritionists and other providers didn't really want to hear about it. People pushed back. Uh, and then I wanted to start, I, I thought we need to research this. I was working in First Nations health, you know, and in the indigenous population, diabetes is so rampant. I thought we should apply this here. And I tried to get money out of the bureaucracy to do it. And there was all kinds of hurdles and roadblocks put in my way. People literally obstructing me from trying to pursue this. So your eyes start to open, you know, you take the red pill and, uh, there are big financial uh, interests that benefit from the current, the status quo in terms of diet and also medical management. There are also people that are ideologically driven that will oppose this. And the ones that come to mind are these crazy people that stole Atkins uh, autopsy report and told everybody he had coronary artery disease. You know, the, the, the PETA, Vagan, that crowd. Uh, and also, I, being at a senior level of Health Canada, this is where the food guide gets produced. So I started looking at the food guide differently, and came to the realization it's not a scientific document. Nobody ever does an RCT with the food guide diet against other diets. It's, so these are, you know, for someone who was deeply ensconced in the status quo, these were troubling epiphanies. And then finally, the science that is used to justify the nutritional approach and the medical approach cannot be trusted. Anyway, this was NHANES data from a few years ago now where they looked at American adults and 88% of them have metabolic problems. And it all comes back, as you've heard from other speakers, it all comes back to insulin resistance basically. So only 12% of Americans at that point in time don't, aren't manifest, manifesting some sign of insulin resistance. So getting back to my career path, 
after I'd been in the government for a while, I, I, did, I was able to convince them to give me some money and I went off to a little First Nations community and we convinced them that they should eat their traditional diet or something similar, which turns out to be a low carb keto diet. And everybody got better and the CBC, uh, doc the Canadian broadcaster made a beautiful documentary about it. You still can find it online. It's called My Big Fat Diet. And uh, I, after I did that, I, the, I got the government to second me over to the university to do this study. Uh, I didn't want to go back to administrative work. I wanted to put this to work uh, for the benefit of patients. So I, my thought was, I'll go back into a limited practice and I'll just do diet, you know, metabolic health. Uh, but in our system, if you've been out of clinical practice for more than three years, you have to apply to the college to be allowed to resume. So I went to the college and um, they said, oh, nobody who's been out of clinical practice as long as you have has ever been able to get back. So I didn't mention that to my wife. Uh, but I said, hold my beer. Uh, and I went to work. I did basically what was a, a, like a rotating internship for about 15 months to finally get myself back up to speed where they would allow me to go back into practice. So this is what I did. And, and um, uh, so when I started building a practice, I was recruiting new patients. Um, and each time I interviewed a new patient, I would do a diet history. And I would ask them, apart from you know, drug and alcohol abuse and so on, what, what do you think is the most important factor in your health? And people agree, it's my diet, right? And I always ask them, has a doctor ever asked you about your diet? Never, never. And I said, don't you find that odd? The most important thing for your health and your doctor never asks you. So this, I found, I found this intriguing, <laughs> but, I have, over the years, actually come to what I think is a, a reason, a rationale for this. It's because we're pragmatic. We don't want to waste our time on something that doesn't work. And the only thing we're taught is the food guide, move more, eat less. And if you try that, you know it doesn't work. So why waste time on it? And I think that's why we never, we stay in our lane. We don't, we don't go in, into nutrition because we don't have the training, we don't have the understanding, we don't have tools that actually work until Ozempic uh, you know, came along. Anyway, so the other thing my patients tell me in these interviews, almost always, it's, it's shocking to me, they always say, um, yeah, you know, I eat meat, but uh, I, I, I avoid red meat. I'm cutting down on red meat, as though this is a, you know, something to be applauded. And I find that troubling. I always ask them why, and I get vague answers and not always clear. Some people are, you know, uh, committed vague answers because they think it's less harm to animals. Some, a lot of people now think it's good for the climate, that if they don't eat that burger, the weather will get better. Uh, nobody does it for religious reasons that I can detect in my patient population. So I, 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 I started trying to understand this. And, you know, there's not a lot of research out there. So I'm not gonna flood you here with charts and graphs. I'm gonna tell you stories and uh, speculate a bit. Uh, religion, I think, started out as an important factor. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Belinda Fetke, the wife of an orthopedic surgeon in Tasmania whose husband was attacked by the uh, college, uh, the physicians, regulatory body because he started telling his patients, I'd rather you stop eating carbohydrates and uh, manage your diabetes better than me having to chop off your foot. And he got into trouble, serious trouble. They really went after him. And she became very curious about this and started looking into the things and really uh, discovered a lot about the influence of Seventh-day Adventists. This is uh, Ellen G. White. Uh, this is in the 1800s. As a young girl, she had a severe head injury and was in a coma for a while and recovered. But after that would have uh, what we would probably call seizures, but they, during which she had visions of God speaking to her. And then she would write down or 
produce tracts, religious tracts, and one of the central tenets of all this was vegetarianism. I think, I think the belief is that uh, Christ won't come back until everybody's a vegetarian or something like that. So in, in my intake of new patients, sometimes if they get me going, I, I talk about this. Um, and uh, we had a family, I, I take new patients even though my practice is full now. I, I think we have a responsibility for our immediate neighborhood. So if a new family moves in, I'll take them. And a family moved in and I interviewed them and they were vegetarians. And I must have been grumpy that day because I went on a little bit of a rant and I mentioned the Seventh-day Adventist. And then <laughs> my wife gets a text. They, they joined the local mom's uh, uh, WhatsApp or whatever, you know, social media group. And they talk about how they met this crazy doctor who, you know, has these conspiracy theories about Seventh-day Adventists. <laughs> and so my wife was invited to join the group and they gave her an effusive welcome and you know, our lovely doctor's wife and blah, 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 silence. And I don't think they've come back to see me. But anyway, the Seventh-day Adventists became big proponents of, of uh, vegetarianism. Uh, this is the, uh, it's called the sanitarium. It's in Battle Creek, Michigan. It was the subject of a movie called The Road to Wellville. And it was about how they would bring people in from all over and give them all kinds of therapies, including inducting them into a vegetarian diet. So it was a big central part of the, the uh, Seventh-day Adventist religion. Now, the interesting thing about Seventh-day Adventists is they kind of fly under the radar. They have more, they're second only to the Catholic Church in terms of the number of institutions they have around the world. Uh, and their influence, their primary purpose, it seems, is to influence nutrition policy everywhere they go. Uh, they actually published a paper, and by the way, Loma Linda is their, one of their central institutions, the University in California here, uh, that publishes reams of research on the benefits of vegetarian diet. And they actually published a paper uh, about five years ago on the, uh, basically bragging about how much influence they've had on nutrition policy around the world. The church's success in its efforts to promote vegetarianism is attested by the popular Blue Zone books, which I think are fraudulent, and worldwide interest in plant-based nutrition, not only for its substantial longevity benefits, they outlive their peers by seven to 10 years, but also to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So they're actually moving, they've moved from religion to health and now to environment. Interesting, right? Uh, here's the, the paper, um, and uh, here's what they say. The emphasis on health ministry within the SDA movement led to the development of sanitariums in mid-19th century America, like the one I showed you there. These facilities, the most notable being Battle Creek, initiated the development of vegetarian foods such as breakfast cereals and analog meats. Now, John Henry Kellogg lived in Helen G.'s White's house when he was a young boy and he tr he did the typesetting on all her religious tracks and he went on to invent breakfast cereal largely as a way to get people to stop eating meat. The ADA church still operates a handful of food production facilities around the world. In fact, in Australia, uh, one of the largest cereal companies, maybe the largest is called Sanitarium and is owned by the church. And they fill doctor's offices with all kinds of brochures and pamphlets and you know, they, they're very much involved with generating the consensus there on vegetarianism. The first uh, Battle Creek dietitian was co-founder of the American Dietetics Association. So their influence also per, per, permeated into the organizations of dietitians and nutritionists, not just in the U.S., but all over the place. And their influence is still felt there. The SDA church established hundreds of hospitals, colleges, secondary schools, tens of thousands of churches around the world, all promoting vegetarian diet. As part of the health message, diet continues to be an important aspect of the church <coughs> and evangelistic efforts. So there, if you didn't know that before, now you do. Uh, now, interesting, the research they generate is observational data, and they generate reams of it a lot of it out of Loma Linda. In Switzerland, uh, this was, what, a few years ago now, about five years, six years ago, 
they had a commission that looked at nutrition and diet, and they looked at vegan diets. And they did something interesting. They lined up studies coming out of Loma Linda and studies from other sources on the same topic, uh, veg the benefits of vegetarianism. And here's what they found. This is cerebrovascular disease. The top ones are the Adventist studies. <clears throat> and the big triangle there uh, is an indication of, you know, kind of the summary of these, that there is a significant benefit to, cardi to uh, vegetarian diet. And then the, the non-SDA studies actually fall on the other side of the line. So maybe there's a bias in your religious beliefs, which, which is something that annoys the heck out of me because when you look at disclosures on papers, scientific papers, everybody has to list their uh, uh, potential sources of bias and it's all financial. Where do you get grants? What corporations have you worked for? And on and on. Nowhere do you have to say, I'm a committed vegan and I think it's sinful to eat meat. Which would seem to me to be a pretty big potential bias, right? But we don't do that. And then they looked at ischemic heart disease and they found similar division in like re relative risk of 0.6 and 0.84, even though it fall, falls on the same line, side of the line, a fairly big disparity in the findings. The other interesting thing when you start to go in and look at the big Adventist health study, which is the one, it's kind of a big ongoing cohort study, observational data, that in six years of follow-up, a cohort of over 8,000 men who drank more than five glasses of water per day cut their risk of fatal MI by more than a half. So why in the world are we spending all this money on statins when we could just tell people to drink an extra, you know, three or four glasses of water a day and with huge benefits on MI? Well, I think the answer is it tells you something about the quality of the research data. Now, the other interesting thing about that benefit, the longevity benefit, with uh, the Adventists is that you find it in other places that are not vegetarian. The Mormons, for instance. Mormon, uh, Mormon uh, adherents tend to have a, a greater longevity and they eat meat and they carry guns and they do all these things that Adventists don't do. Uh, this was an interesting example, the Rosetto effect. Uh, was a small town in uh, Pennsylvania Italian immigrants, close-knit community, lots of social interaction and support and so on. And it, it turns out they have an unusually low rate of MI compared to similar communities nearby. And <coughs> they, they did studies and concluded that it was all these other factors that had a mitigating effect on cardiovascular disease. So is that what's going on with these uh, religious cults and sects and uh, communities and so on? Probably. But they would have us eating, you know, a grain-based diet. Here's a term I came across, grainwashing. The process by which the world has come to believe that the same method that farmers employ to fatten pigs will make them thin and healthy. And here it is out of the Farmer Cyclopedia from 1912. If you want to fatten your pigs, you feed them skim milk along with cornmeal, which is similar to what I used to eat for breakfast. Now, let's talk about how meat causes cancer. The IARC is a committee at, of the WHO specifically looking at cancer risk. And they met in 2014 and recommended that red meat and processed meat should be evaluated um, ba based on previous studies, epidemiological studies, probably <coughs> Seventh-day Adventist studies would have been in there. Uh, and so they, looked, they, they commissioned an actual review of meat. And you probably heard about this because the headlines were uh, processed meat in the same category as tobacco for health risk. So this is from the WHO website. What types of cancers are linked or associated with eating processed meat? The working group concluded that eating processed meat causes colorectal cancer. 
not associated with, but causes. An association with stomach cancer was also seen, but the evidence is not conclusive. What types of cancer are linked or associated with red meat? The strongest but still limited, limited evidence for association with red meat is for colorectal cancer, also evidence with pancreatic and prostate cancer. So that's pretty scary. And that did get a lot of headlines. How many studies did they look at? The working group considered more than 800 different studies on cancer in humans, uh, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then you had this sort of reaction. Meat is a cancer risk. People should eat a plant-based diet. So it turns out that out of those 800 studies that they considered, they didn't actually include them. They only included, uh, what's that, 56 studies. They kind of put that out there. I would call that misinformation or disinformation. And let's zoom in on those 56 studies. So 29 of them looked at colorectal cancer. Of those 29, 15 found that red meat was actually beneficial. 14 found that it was bad. So that was where they said the data was limited. Well, yeah, it was limited because it actually showed it was a benefit. 27 looked at colorectal cancer and processed meat. <coughs> Nine of them found that processed meat was good. 18 found that it was bad. They neglected to include one study, which was actually a trial. These are observational data. But one study, there was a trial where they fed bacon to rats and the rats that ate the bacon had better outcomes, but they didn't include that one. So when I see that, it looks to me like something's not right, right? Out comes my hammer. What is the role of meat in a healthy diet? David Clearfeld was on that committee at the IARC. I read a big interview with him after he had participated in that, and he said the deck was loaded. He said most of the people that came in were vegetarians and that they already had their result and they just had to find the papers to back it up. And he actually described it as the worst experience of his professional life. He leads the ag uh, uh, Nutritional Research Division of the U.S. Agricultural Department. And he's a well-published mainstream nutritional researcher. So he kind of blew the whistle on them. <clears throat> so red meat is a very nutritious food. In fact, it's probably one of the foods where you can live pretty much exclusively on red meat and nothing else as you've seen in earlier talks. And here's a comparison of you know, what do people think it is and what is it exactly, and it's full of all these wonderful nutrients and micronutrients. But, and this is from Clerfeld's article, he talks about <coughs> red meat and how nutritious it is and all these things, and that it, is, it meets the requirements of uh, most of the nutritional shortages that we see around the world. Uh, despite their claims, and he published this about three or four years after the, the committee, uh, he basically debunks it, says they didn't really have the data or the evidence that they said they did. And he concludes, it's likely that the association of red meat consumption with colon cancer is explained either by an inability of epidemiology, and these were observational studies, to detect such a small risk, or by combinations of other factors, such as greater overweight, less exercise. In other words, all the confounding factors. So I think the argument for the health risks of red meat is <clears throat> hollow. I, you know, I don't have time to go through everything every allegation, but it's all pretty much the same. It's all observational data with very small hazard ratios and lots of confounding variables. And it's agenda driven, in my opinion. But now we have this issue of the planet. So if you don't want to avoid it for religious reasons, and maybe you're not so sure it's bad for your health, well, you don't want to kill the planet, right? <coughs> Funny story, my daughter in grade six was given an assignment to give a talk on something, topic of her choice. And one of her classmates picked, cows are killing the planet. What do you think my doctor, daughter talked? But <laughs> and who do you think helped her? But anyway, uh, so 
Greens versus beefetarians. This is a Guardian British newspaper. Europeans go to war over their dinner, meat, meat consumption, twice the global average. We'll have to reconcile environmental concerns and culinary traditions. Greenpeace, European publication. Climate, EU climate diet, they have to cut meat by 71% by 2030, <coughs> and even further by 2050. Got to get rid of that meat, it's killing the planet. Uh, many Europeans are taking the issue seriously. Almost half are now eating less red meat than they once did. 40% are planning on reducing it. Bill Gates, that brilliant nutritionist <laughs> and vaccinologist and virologist. Anyway, Bill Gates says rich nations need to remove, move to 100% synthetic beef, and I'm pretty sure he doesn't invest in any of those com companies. <laughs> the assault, oh, thank you, you noticed. Uh, the assault on the beef industry continues with fake meat proponents seeking to eliminate meat, dairy, and eggs from America's dinner table. So I'm really pleased to take nutritional advice from this guy. <laughs> He's the guy that made 500 million on COVID vaccine before he started saying they didn't work. Now, Frank Mitloiner, I don't know if Steve's come across him. He's at UC Davis and he's a, a, a climate, a, atmosphere kind of scientist. <clears throat> and he does work on things like uh, methane and nitrogen and so on. And he says, we have more horses than dairy cows in the US, not to mention 140 million dogs and cats consuming the equivalent amount of food as 70 million people. Curious why cows, but never horses, dogs, or cats are an environmental issue. <coughs> Isn't that curious? Doesn't sound quite right to me, right? And it's not that I'm against cats. This is, this is Coco Bean, the newest addition to our family. Uh, yeah. And I'm not inclined to eat her. <laughs> uh, now, the issue around uh, beef cattle and the environment is fascinating because there is a consensus that it's bad. But if you dig, you can find some pretty convincing contrarian evidence. Here was a study on the role of grazing lands in the carbon balance estimations, a, a big meta-analysis. <coughs> Our results show that grazing lands generate carbon surpluses that could, carbon storage surpluses that could not only offset rural emissions, but also partially or totally offset emissions from other sectors. In other words, the amount of carbon that gets sequestered in grazing lands is, is way more than gets generated from grazing lands. And it's probably because of this. On one side you see a typical crop, monoculture crop with very shallow root systems. And on the other you see natural grasslands with very deep, deep complex root systems which sequester a lot of carbon. Um, if you look at U.S. greenhouse gas emissions, and this is official data, might not, might overstate the case, but anyway, what you see on the left there is the energy sector generating huge amounts of greenhouse gas. Then you have industrial processes and product use, the orange bar, waste, and agriculture in blue. Now that's total agriculture, it's all the monocrop and the diesel machinery and all this stuff of which uh, cattle is a, par a small part or a fraction and beef a smaller fraction. And then on the far right, <coughs> that is a neg it, 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 it sequesters more. It's a negative greenhouse gas emitter. It's land use, land use change and forestry. So in other words, if you look, and this was done 1990 to 2021, US Department of Agri uh, US EPA, that there's actually improvements in sequestering carbon going on in that sector. And land use and land use change includes things like grazing. Now, beef, you know, there's, there's this argument out there, and I think this is the ideological stuff coming out, is the suggestion that we should just grow the crops and eat them ourselves rather than feeding them to cattle, that's inefficient. 
Well, it turns out if you look carefully at it, and we're looking at protein, important protein, and high, high value protein, <coughs> they conclude uh, our results suggest that each individual beef sector and the entire value chain produce more high quality human edible protein than is consumed in production. In other words, raising beef cattle produces more protein than they eat. Accordingly, beef is a net contributor to meeting human protein requirements. So why in the world would you want to get rid of that? I, I don't know who Kathleen Norris is, but she said, it's one of the miracles of nature that this empty looking land can be of such great use, that cattle can convert its grasses into meat and milk. And the climate alarmists would have us believe that this is harmful to the planet and that we should stop eating that and we should start doing this. <coughs> doesn't look quite right to me, okay? Out comes my hammer. So let me wrap up here. Are we meant to eat meat? I think there's an argument here if you look historically, physiologically, anatomi anatomically, that you can construct a pretty convincing argument. An article here, the evolution of the human trophic level during the Pleistocene. Low gastric pH is characteristic of meat-eating animals. We have one of the lowest. Fat cell structure. Predators have high numbers of small cells. We have high numbers of small cells. Stable isotopes. Uh, examination of ancient bones finds that people and our predecessors ate a meat diet with high fat. Okay, let's wrap up talking about why you can't trust the science. You've probably came across this. Richard Horton, editor of Lancet, basically says, after being an editor of one of the premier journals, that you can't really trust what we publish. And he's not the only one. <coughs> editor, two, two other editors that I'm aware of, of premier journals, have come out with a similar statement that the whole system is flawed and that it's driven by agenda, it's driven by vested interests, and so on. Uh, John Ioannidis is uh, an interesting guy, a very well-published uh, Stanford uh, researcher who does work that's kind of critical of how other science is done. And he talks here about the challenge of reforming nutritional epidemiological research. And this is so important because so much of nutrition policy is based on epidemiological research and it's very flawed. He says, some nutrition scientists and much of the public often consider epidemiological associations of nutrition factors to represent causal effects and can inform public policy and guidelines. However, the emerging picture of epidemiology is difficult to reconcile with good scientific principles. The field needs radical reform. Now, when he published that, before it, well, the, the, let me go on here. There, there was another study, a series of studies actually, that was queued up to be published, uh, showing that the science supporting red meat prohibitions, like the recommendations against red meat, was deeply flawed. Uh, this is their abstract. I'm going to speed up because the clock is telling me the electric shocks are starting soon. Uh, they, they found, they published good data or good analysis saying that we don't have evidence to support these ideas that red meat's bad. And before it actually got published, there was a big campaign uh, uh, aimed at the publisher to not publish the study. Uh, Backlash. There was actually an article published uh, on this in JAMA. Uh, and they talked about how it's almost unheard of for medical journals to get blowback before the study actually comes out. And it was all coordinated by the epidemiology guys, the, 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 uh, the guys that David Katz is a big vegetarian proponent, runs the True Health Initiative, which labels foods uh, based on their health uh, value. And he gives eggs a low grade and sugar pops a high grade, that kind of stuff. And Walter Willett and Frank Hu are in league with him at Harvard. These are the guys publishing the big, big epidemiological papers. And they fought tooth and nail to prevent this study from even getting, seeing the light of day. Uh, so the, the, the author of that critique said, I can understand it's upsetting when the limitations of your work are uncovered and discussed in the open. The field needs radical reform. Now I was gonna spend a minute on my children, the, the shocks are gonna start coming here, 
because I think it's important. I raise my kids low carb. That's my wife, my son, and my daughter preparing to eat a meal of steak and cauliflower mash typical in our house. You can see how malnourished my son is at the age of 15. Uh, he's kind of ugly. Um, he got into med school in uh, Royal College of Surgeon in Ireland at the age of 17, won the class award for top academics, graduated first class honors uh, this uh, just in May and is now doing um, a residency in internal medicine at Rutgers. And while he was busy uh, slacking off at med school, he taught himself how to play the guitar, and this is him playing in a nightclub in Ireland. My daughter, who uh, was her entire life raised low carb, started skiing Whistler at the age of two, and has literally skied every winter weekend there since then. Now she's 14, she's a competitive sailor out on the ocean there, and Academically, she's outperforming her brother. <laughs> so <laughs> you can see how damaging the low-carb keto diet was when you raise kids that way. Just concluding, the worst mistake in the history of the human race, Jared Diamond, the famous evolutionary biologist, wrote this article in Discover Magazine in 1999, comparing, looking at research comparing skeletal remains of hunter-gatherers and agrarian ancestors and finding that health uh, markers uh, went downhill when people switched from hunter-gatherer to agrarian. So Occam's razor, the simple answer is likely to be the correct one. Hanlon's razor, never attribute to malice that which can be explained by stupidity. <laughs> <coughs> Wartman's razor, never attribute to stupidity that which can be explained by corruption. Okay? All right. Thank you so much. Oh, some of you are old enough to remember this guy who said, if you want my gun, you have to take it from my cold, dead hand. This is my, I don't have a gun, <laughs> but they'll have to take that from my cold, dead hand. Thank you, that was great. So I'm a little concerned about what just happened in the Netherlands. Yes. Not so long ago. And I would like you to just speak on that a little bit and what you think might be the trajectory. Well, in your materials, there is a piece of tin foil. I want you to fashion a hat out of it. I, I, for the life of me, have a hard time understanding what's going on there. If you don't know, the, the government of the Netherlands has uh, ordered a significant number of farmers to sell their farms to the government. On, and, and part of the deal, ostensibly it's because of nitrogen pollution and they're in sensitive areas. Well, <clears throat> Netherlands, that little tiny country, turns out to be the second largest exporter of agricultural products in the world. So therefore, they have the most efficient farmers in, to extract that kind of um, export out of just a tiny little piece of land. And they, they say it's because they're in sensitive areas, but the, the deal they're offering them, it's not they're being forced to take, is the government's going to buy their property and they have to sign an agreement that they will not farm anywhere else in the EU. So if it's just about protecting that particular little area of sensitive land, why would they do that? And a country that is the most efficient and, you know, amazing products, agricultural products, mostly meat and dairy and things like that, what, what's going on? You know, I think it's part of this large Annie Red Meat conspiracy, frankly. In Canada, our lovely Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, tried the same thing. He said, Western farmers, you're going to have to cut your nitrogen use by 30%. And that didn't go over very well. There was this huge pushback and then it disappeared from the radar. But this is the underlying agenda. Why would you do that in a world that needs this kind of high quality protein that you get from raising animals and producing dairy and meat products? I, I don't know the answer. I'm quite puzzled by it. So Bill Gates has become one of the largest landowners in the country. Yeah. I'm from Nebraska. He's bought 20,000 acres. Do you know the details of what he's doing? Is he pulling it out of ranching? Is it all driven towards corn and soybeans? I think he's going to raise insects. I, <laughs> I, I, I'm puzzled by that. I think I'm, I'm not, I'm worried about it because I don't trust this guy. 
I, I, you know, I hate to sound like a totally crazy lunatic, but he comes from a back, a history of eugenics, you know, the, all that kind of stuff. Is this, are we, what are, are we really, what we're looking at, is it an attempt to reduce population? Because really these kinds of moves away from uh, uh, really good nutritional products, cutting those away and replacing them with all these processed, uh, highly processed artificial products makes no sense to me from a nutritional perspective. And like I said, <clears throat> I, I don't think these people are stupid. So I think there is an element of corruption under here. There's an underlying agenda. There's a, some kind of corruption, whether it's money for fake meat products or what, what el whatever your mind, wherever dark place your mind might go. Something else is driving this because they can't be that stupid. Anyway, sorry I don't have a better answer. He doesn't return my emails. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any suggestions for uh, getting rid of meatless Mondays in our school system? You know, you know, the new mayor of New York is a vegan. And when he, first thing he did when he got in was he had meatless Fridays as well. He had another catchy name for it. So they're pushing this on onto children, which I think is terrible. I just really think it's egregious. Yeah, I wish, it, I, I totally agree. We should get rid of that. It's nuts. What do you think about Walter Longo? Do you know Walter Longo? I'm sorry? Do you know Walter Longo? Longo? Longo. Uh, not, not very much. No. Oh, okay, okay. Well, no. <laughs> the question was, what, what do you think about uh, his works? Because he's, uh, he, 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 he talks about longevity. He's a good reference in the world. Mm -hmm. That he's <laughs> a vegan or... He's total vegan. Well, I, I think keto diet has been shown to be beneficial in terms of longevity. There's rodent studies that are quite interesting. Telomeres uh, improve. Um, I, I actually have verged into carnivore myself. Um, uh, I was, uh, when my son started med school in Dublin, I went to there to get him set up and had dinner with Ivor Cummins. And... Mm -hmm. I, <laughs> Yeah, and Ivor, you know, he's got, he's, he's got a wife and five kids, like Irish guy, and love, beautiful family, and he had me over for dinner, and we have wonderful discussions. And he had, so I'll back up a little bit. When I was 23 and spending all my money on fast cars and things, I crashed, I had a serious motorcycle accident. I hit a car, both car and motorcycle were written off. I flew off the bike, hit the A-pillar of the car with my face, And this is why I don't look like Brad Pitt anymore. But anyway, the, uh, five years ago, uh, I started having severe neck pain. I had had a bad hyperextension injury in the crash. And I thought, okay, I'm like an old rugby player. These uh, trauma from earlier in life, I'm going to have to get a spinal fusion. I was in pain 24 hours a day. I couldn't shoulder check in the car. And that was the state I was in when I went to have dinner with Ivor. And he had just been to... Budapest, where he visited Paleo Medicina, the clinic where they use what they call a paleo keto diet to heal leaky gut, and they're reporting all kinds of benefits from it. And so he'd actually gone and visited them, and he was telling me about it, and I thought, I'll take that for a test drive. So that was my first experience with carnivore, and their diet, very difficult one to remember, meat, eggs, salt, water. So I did that for a while. And It's really hard to do that because you, the, the difficult part of that is you have to get your, your energy from fat and animal fat and non-dairy. So what does that leave? So I was buying uh, pork bellies and measuring it out and calculating how much fat was there and ground beef and a little bit of liver. I had got my own meat grinder, was making my own sausage with all the proportions worked out and, and f eating that with some eggs, you know, and it was good. I was sustaining it and all my joint pain went away all went away, and I found it was too hard to keep that going, so I eased back into keto, and it hasn't come back. And now in my clinical practice, I suggest this to people once in a while, uh, because a lot of my patients now are very oriented to keto, they do low carb, reduced carb, some, some keto. Had a lovely woman come in, she's raised two beautiful boys, and uh, she's been keto since she started seeing me a few years ago. She started having joint pain, so I told her my 
carnivore story. That was about two years ago. I haven't seen her since. But her husband came in and he said, oh yeah, she's full carnivore, all her joint pain's gone away, and her asthma has cleared up. She doesn't use inhalers anymore. So I'm really impressed with the therapeutic potential of these what are, you know, arguably extreme diet changes, but tremendous potential so therapeutically. So I, I'm not that familiar with Longo, but I, it sounds like we might be on the same page. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Hi. I'm, I'm just curious what your talking points are when your patients come in and they ask, they, they tell, they're convinced that they need to be vegan for health. Well, I find vegans don't usually want to talk to me. Uh, <laughs> I, I, with my vegan patients, I have kind of a truce. You know, we un they understand where I'm coming from, I understand their position, and I don't harass them too much, you know, just out of kindness. But I'm very concerned that it's not a healthy diet. And my aging vegan patients, they, they don't have any muscle tone, they, they get all kinds of vague chronic problems. One of them's starting to drift into dementia now. And troubling to me, but, but people that are in that sort of extreme uh, system are, they don't want to hear about it. They, they're very much uh, in, locked in. Vegetarians, usually I, I have a conversation with them and I'll, they'll tell me how much, oh, I, I'm eating tons of vegetables every day. And I'll usually say to them, has it occurred to you that the vegetables don't want to be eaten? <laughs> and that usually <laughs> breaks the ice. And we talk about anti-nutrients, we talk about, you know, the fact that there's no really good science behind all those recommendations. This big health halo around fruit, there's no science behind that. And it's, what there is is all observational and flawed. So and this is the kind of discussion I have, but I have brief interventions. I'm not a counselor, I don't, I don't have long interactions with my patients. And I get pretty good response. I don't think they all abandon carbs but I've had quite a few success stories, and a lot of them are very much more mindful about their diet and tend to move in the right direction, in my opinion. But it's, you know, I'm often asked when I get into this with my patients, they have, why don't you write a book? Well, why would I write a book when everything I want you to do, I can write on one page? So I admire people that can sit down and generate an interesting book, and there's some of them in the audience here, people I admire, but I'm not one of them. Thank you. Uh, good talk. And I'm wondering if, rather than getting rid of meat altogether, that the forces that be would, would, would appreciate sort of a class distinction. In other words, the, the, where the rich and the influential, um, the managerial, would still get access to their meat, and the poor and the third world would be stuck eating uh, the worst of the plant base, like you did when you grew up uh, eating cornflakes and skim milk. There, there may be things like that underlying this, yes. because I, I, it's like the climate alarmists who fly around in their private, private jets. I, I think there is an element of that, of, of an elitism that separates them from everyone else. <clears throat> Thanks for your great talk. I wanted to ask if you have any references for bioavailability data when people eat meat, showing vitamin levels and such going up compared to plant sources of protein. I, I don't have that off the top of my head, but I know there, are, there is literature in that area and it generally shows that what you can, you know, all these things are in, that are in plants, supposedly micronutrients and other beneficial things, that you absorb them much, much better from animal foods than mm -hmm. you do from an equivalent plant food. But they don't tell you that when they line them up on a chart and mm -hmm. promote a plant-based diet. That's not part of this disclosure. But I, one of the things I talk to my patients about <clears throat> is what anti-nutrients can do. And in terms of uh, interfering with micronutrient absorption, for instance, <coughs> there was an interesting study where they gave people uh, oyst a portion of oysters to raise their zinc level. And then they showed that if you combine the oyster with uh, black beans, that you cut your zinc absorption in half because of phytic acid in the black beans, which, bi which binds with divalent ions. 
And if you combine it with corn tortilla, you almost cut it to zero because of the amount of phytate. And that's an eye-opener for people. And, and all this push on plant-based diet and load your plate with all this and live on lentils and stuff, no mention of that stuff. And I think what, what I see, what I suspect, with plant people that are eating you know, vegetarian or vegan diets, that they, over time, develop micronutrient deficiencies mm. that manifest in all kinds of vague ways. It's hard to connect it back directly. And this is what I tell my patients. Okay, thanks. Dr. Wartman, I think you said everything you want your patients to do, you can write on one page. What do you write on the one page? <laughs> avoid carbs, avoid vegetable oils, that's part of the story, um, and uh, fill your boots with fatty meats and fatty dairy products. That's pretty much it. I, I, I eat zero fruit, and I advise my patients, at least initially, to do the same, and certainly no starchy vegetables. A few non-starchy vegetables are fine. <clears throat> That's the sort of advice I give. Sometimes I'll write down things to eat and things not to eat on one page, just to give them a, examples. But, you know, nowadays there's so much information out there on the web. So many people have good blogs. So Mike Eads over there has a wonderful thing he publishes every, was it every week or something? The Arrow? I don't know how you find the time, Mike. I thought you liked to play golf. Uh, there are so many good sources out there now that I tend not to start to give too much detail. I tell them, go, f go find it. Um, so that's why I haven't written a book. <laughs> so I've seen during my lifetime the vegan craze come about, and my understanding is that there's fertility issues involved in plant-based diets. Um, is this going to be a sh one generational thing or a couple of generational things or are they just going to bend and allow the meat products in order for fertility or will it be in vitro? Hard to say. I, I, I think there are effects like that. Um, and and the, the, the worst thing is when they do have babies and they feed them a vegan diet uh, from childbirth, which I think is criminal. In some places it is becoming a criminal offense. Not, not in our enlightened society here, but I think s might be Germany, somewhere over there. But yes, uh, uh, vi the, the def people that are vegan are malnourished. I think that's a fact. I, I don't think you can dispute it. They'll argue against it, and they'll argue that you can have a healthy diet as a vegan. And interestingly, the health authorities, like the Dietitians Association, the Food Guides, and so on, will, will endorse that, that I you can have a healthy diet eating that way if you do this, this, and this, and supplement, and so on. They won't say that about a low-carb diet. That eliminating a macronutrient, oh, no, you can't do that. Well, yeah, you can if you're a vegan. So there's a double standard there. But I do think vegan diet is malnourishment. Thank you. Have you had, um, have you had any issues with uh, older patients, especially um, really elderly with uh, protein absorption, B12 absorption, maybe lower stomach acid kind of um, issues, and um, um, if so, what would be your recommendations um, on that? Well, I, I think it's never too late to move your diet in that direction, low carb, keto, maybe carnivore, but I do find that with elderly patients, given the amount of lifespan they have left and the potential benefit over a short period of time that, that might be, that I don't push too hard. I do have the odd elderly, elderly patient who's embraced this and has done well, but I, I, my expectations of them are less. Everybody's on a proton pump inhibitor these days, and I think, I think that's got to be a factor in how well they digest and absorb protein. Uh, but I haven't actually... Uh, taken it, t tackled it head on with elderly patients. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I encourage, well, yes, certainly I tell my patients get the fatty cuts of meat, eat as much animal fat as you can, dairy fats, I think, eat, if you drink milk, full fat milk, full fat yogurt, that sort of thing, get the fatty cheeses, yeah, big time fat. Mm hmm. 
How long did it take you to feel the effects uh, on your pain from switching to more carnivore? It was actually fairly quick. Within, I would say within a week or two. And, and that neck pain vanished. I was struggling for a long time. And, uh, and then when I eased back into keto, it didn't really come back. Every once in a while, I start to get a little bit of it, and then I'll, do, I'll go carnivore just for a little period of time, and it goes away. You can dose yourself. You can intermittently dose yourself with carnivore, mm. is what I find. Thank you. Thank you. Great talk, as expected. Uh, I have two friends in Canada who went through major stuff with the medical board speaking out. You seem to be a little bit more vocal than them. Did they give you any trouble? Did you ever have complaints or have to deal with those kind of things? I, no one's ever filed a complaint with the college about me um, on this topic. I had a very mentally disturbed woman file one, but uh, it wasn't about diet, and uh, I wasn't convicted. Um, <laughs> But I, 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 I sometimes worry a little bit. One example is statins. Um, my patients are all educated about statins. And then we refer them to the cardiologists. And I get consult notes back and it says, patient, patient needs to be on a statin, mm -hmm. but patient is reluctant to try a statin. So they know what I'm up to, right? And uh, the lovely group of cardiologists in our community, and one day one of them was at our clinic to give us a little lunchtime talk, and in the chit chat uh, he said, "Yeah, they, they know what I'm up to, and uh, they thought that they would it would be a good idea to challenge me to a debate at Grand Rounds in our hospital, and they thought that was a brilliant idea until it, one of them had to step up, and none of them would, <laughs> none of them would step up <laughs> to debate me. So I think they're a little bit." you know, have mixed feelings about it, but none of them have reported me to the college. I get a follow-up question since no one's behind me. <laughs> My personal best for being deplatformed from YouTube is one minute with uh, Dr. Peter McCullough. Do you think you and I could break that record? Oh, <laughs> no, he's, he's an all-time record holder, that guy. He, <laughs> yeah, I like him, by the way. Me too, me too a lot. Yeah. Would, you, would you do a case study? No, because I'm struggling recommending low-carb diet to my typical patient, diabetes, hemoglobin A1C11, chronic kidney disease, stage 3B, some peripheral neuropathy. And so I'm concerned if I recommend, you know, low-carb, uh, kind of all kind of diet, and then patient is about, you know, I, I, I always think that they are standing at the edge of having a heart attack. So mm -hmm. when they change the diet and they happen to have a heart attack, you know, I'm responsible for it. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I understand. And you do have patients that are in big trouble and precar they're precarious. <clears throat> they could fall off the edge any time. <clears throat> I sometimes have that conversation with patients. Um, this is what I would recommend, but if you walk out the door and drop dead on the sidewalk, I'll get blamed if you do it. And this is often around statins. You know, if I de-prescribe de statins, I'll tell them that. So, it, yeah, it's a tough one. So far, I haven't had a problem there. I've, I've encouraged people like your patient to do it. And with somebody like that amount of kidney disease, you don't want to ramp up the protein too much, but they can ramp up their fat. And there is some evidence, actually, that low-carb keto is beneficial for a kidney that's failing. So I'm cautious about people like that, but I don't, I don't completely uh, hold back. Thank you, Dr. Wartman. I'm back here in the back ans asking questions for people from the live stream. Oh. We've got almost 70 people watching from around the world currently. And one of the people following, Heidi, she'd like to know what you were eating before you went to the elimination diet. Ah, okay. Well, I, confession time. I was a vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> and I was a classic Dunning-Kruger. I thought I knew what I was doing and I clearly didn't. Typical doctor, you know, because you're trained in one area, you think you know everything. And I thought, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, low, 
low saturated fat, lots of, you know, pasta and focaccia bread. And, <clears throat> and so I did that for about 17 years until I had full florid, full blown type 2 diabetes. And then it was like, what the heck was I thinking? And then I actually started to educate myself about nutrition. So yeah, I was eating a high carb uh, vegetarian diet. Yeah. And how long have you been eating low carb now? 21 years. Mm -hmm. And I showed you my kids. I, we, skiing was our family thing. We live an hour from Whistler, which is awesome skiing. And my ability, my stamina on the ski hill improved dramatically after I went low carb. And it wasn't because I was exercising more. In fact, I'm pretty lazy. I don't exercise much at all. And my stamina improved to the point where the, at Whistler, it's a f one mile vertical drop, takes three lifts to get to the very top. And there's a run that goes all the way down. Steve Finney knows this one. All the way down. It's a seven kilometer, you know, five mile run. And I used to love that run, but I'd stop and rest a few times <laughs> on the way down. After being fully adapted to low carb, I, I could ski it nonstop. And I actually did it with the GoPro and it's posted on YouTube. It's called Peak to Creek in five minutes. <coughs> if you don't believe me. Wow, that's impressive. So I think it's amazing how much it improves energy metabolism. And uh, you heard some of the discussion around mitochondria and so on. Fundamentally important. I think it's a fundamentally important part of the benefits of keto. And, you know, when you look at these hunter-gatherers, these lean people that are, they're not going to the gym. They're not running, you know, 10K every morning. In fact, research on hunter-gatherer energy expenditure versus agrarian farmer energy expenditure, the hunter-gatherers don't expend that much energy. And consequently, I'm, I live the life of a hunter-gatherer. I don't exercise that much. Could you tell us when you started having neck pain and went carnivore, just eating fatty meat, water, and salt, what were you eating before that? I was keto. I so was keto. were you eating, you eating meat and vegetables? I was eating vegetables, dairy, yeah. Yeah. And the, the, the concept there with uh, that paleo-keto diet is that it's the anti-nutrients in plants that provoke leaky gut. And there is some evidence from different places on that and that leaky gut leads to a range of problems, inflammatory, autoimmune, even mental health. And that if you cure the leaky gut, then you're on your road to fixing these other problems. And uh, they make a pretty convincing case of that, in my opinion. And then you experience yourself and you feel better. Okay. Yes, I do a lot of N of one. Yeah. yeah. Second question, and I'll read it verbatim. What is the argument against TMAO as the proposed cause of meat risk? Is there another proposed mechanism? Well, the, the TMAO thing is kind of crazy because you get TMAO from other places as well that are not, uh, you know, supposed to be causing uh, cancer and disease, other diseases. So I don't think, I, th I think that's a blind alley, totally. Uh, is, did I understand your question to be what, what else in meat could be causing health problems? Mm. W yes? What is, yeah, what is it there? Is there another proposed mechanism? Uh, well, I, I'm at a disadvantage here because I don't think meat causes health problems. Uh, and, and I think they, they try, well, saturated fat was a big one. Uh, and then there's the argument that if you eat too much meat, the pro the, the nitrogen is going to harm your kidneys, which is not true. Um, so I'm a little adrift there because I, first of all, I don't accept the premise. I don't think meat causes bad, bad health outcomes. Okay. Hello, thank you for your talk. Um, <clears throat> I have a background in something called macrobiotics. You may have heard of it uh, many, little, many years. Closer not to the mic there, please. Yeah. Is it working? Yeah, yeah it is. But Get a little closer. Hi. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I have a background. I uh, used to run a macrobiotic center. Are you familiar with macrobiotics? Yeah. A lot of people out there do. I it. was a hippie back in the day. Yes, it was. Yeah. Well, I, was, I practiced macrobiotic for 40 years and finally woke up. And uh, there were some issues in it with our health, my, my wife and I. And uh, so we've been carnivore almost two years. At any rate, 
the Physicians for, Physicians for Responsible Medicine was always a place that we went to. Uh, Neil Bernard and all these bizarre people and what's going on, and I'd really like to know how do we battle these guys because they're really, I mean, it's, it's crazy. Right? I had lunch with like Neil Bernard once. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I said, we should, we should do a study. You know, I'll pit my keto diet against your diet. Let's go head to head. Let's do a, a controlled trial. And he nodded and smiled and was very polite. And, and that was the end of that. Uh, and he is not a very robust person physically. That was my other observation. Yes, I agree. <laughs> How do we battle that? Well, personally, I think the, the segment of the population that is vegan or really strict uh, uh, vegetarian is actually quite small. And the recidiv recidivism rate is very high. Vegans only stick to it for about three years on average. There are the examples of ones that do it for a longer period of time. And I think that's because they're influencers or you know, spokespeople or whatever. And, and I'm sure there are people there that are thoroughly convinced that it's the right thing to do for their health as their health visibly deteriorates. So given how small a fraction of the population they are, they get way more airtime and way more influence. Like, look at this mayor of New York, a whole very populated city. Now the kids avoid meat, not just Monday, but also on Friday. So how in the world does that make sense? Doesn't seem quite right to me. I want to take my hammer, you know? <laughs> so I don't know the answer. How do we fix it? I, I, but I do think we need to, because I think it's, it, it, you know, it, to deprive people of pro arguably the most nutritious food you can eat, I think is a bad idea. Um, just on N, on N equals one, um, I've been ketovore for over a year. Um, I have compromised kidney functioning. And when I started ketovore, my EGFR was 32. Last test, it was 63. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, mm -hmm. uh, my question is, have you seen a book called The Great Plant-Based Con? Yes. I've okay, seen it. yeah. Much of your talk seemed reminiscent of that book. I, I didn't plagiarize it because I have to confess I didn't, I didn't so, read yeah. it, but I know, I'm, I know about it, yeah. Another question from the live stream. Um, when eliminating dairy, especially in postmenopausal women with osteoporosis, what are your thoughts on sources of calcium? Interesting question, because I don't think osteoporosis is simply a matter of calcium metabolism. <clears throat> your bones are in constant flux, osteoclasts and osteoblasts. And if they're in harmony, you don't lose bone mass. But if the clasts outperform the blasts, you do. So you need to figure out why that's going on. And I think there are multiple uh, underlying issues. Vitamin D status is, is certainly important. Um, vitamin K2 is important. Um, inflammatory conditions, because there is a, like most chronic illnesses, there is an element of an underpinning of inflammatory activity. So I, what I counsel my patients is, make sure you have good vitamin D status preferably from the sun, like, like me, like I do, uh, this time of year. But if not, supplement, and make sure you you're taking K2. I tell them if we were all living in the south of France, we wouldn't be having this discussion. We'd be getting all our K2 from wonderful grass-fed dairy, and we'll be getting Mediterranean sun. But do that, and if you do that, you will improve your ability to absorb calcium from your diet. So you don't need to go taking calcium supplements or pursuing uh, any particularly high calcium foods. You'll get enough calcium from a regular diet. Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> another one regarding your meat recommendations. Do you include fish in those? I like fish. I go fishing up north near Alaska every year, except this year because my fishing buddies in, at Rutgers. Um, I like fish. I think fish is a very healthy food. I, I had a patient in my practice, we're, we're on the water in West Vancouver and he's a wealthy guy in a big house right on the waterfront and he was a fish fanatic, he was eating tuna and salmon all week long 
And he started getting all these vague problems. And we tested his blood lead levels. And he had too much lead. Oh. Uh, oh, sorry, mercury. mercury. Sorry, mercury. Yeah, we tested his mercury levels. And there is a downside to eating too much predator fish, clearly. And I don't think, you know, I don't think, I don't think a diet just of fish is sufficient. I'm, as you probably noticed, somewhat biased towards red meat. So I think a diet with red meat and fish as well, I think that's a perfectly healthy diet. Would it be as often as one to two times a week or less? Sure. One, one or two to times a week would be fine. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I don't see any other questions. Thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Can you, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, can you give us an update on the Ulican industry? Oh, Ulican. So this, this goes back to the documentary I told you about that we did. Um, one of the fascinating things I learned because I was working in uh, First Nations Health when all this started, and uh, I started looking at the traditional diet on the west coast of Canada, and I was fascinated to learn that probably the singular most important staple food in that diet was not salmon, it was oolican grease. Oolican are little smelt-like fish that are, they call rescue fish. It's the first one that comes up the river after the ice breaks. And they come in huge, huge quantities. It's like one of these force of nature events. And uh, for hundreds, if not longer, hundreds of years or more, uh, the coastal First Nations would move the villages all down to the Ulican River and set up family camps and they would harvest the Ulican fish and process it with this gentle, simmering, round-the-clock kind of a s process they do to, to uh, extract the oil from this fish. And the fi it's a very oily fish. It's about, I think it's about 40% oil, the b body weight. Uh, Steve Finney and I collected the fish and collected some of the samples of the Ulican grease and had it analyzed in a lab in uh, Minnesota and published a paper on it because we were fascinated with this, the question here being, why did they go to all that trouble to extract the oil from that one little fish when they were surrounded by sources of fat? The, there's lots of other fatty fish. Sa salmon are quite fatty in that area. Land mammals, sea mammals, lots of sources of fat. But for time immemorial, they would go down to the river and spend weeks or months extracting the oil from that little fish, storing it in those bent wood cedar boxes that the West Coast are famous for, transporting it inland to trade to other populations who didn't have access to the fishery, and eating a significant amount of their daily diet of this one particular fat. And it, it was such a fascinating story, and we published that paper, and one of the findings in the paper was, well, let me put it this way. If your body stores energy, you store it primarily as fat. And our fat that we store has a fatty acid profile. It's not all one type of fatty acid. There is a fatty acid profile, and it's somewhat affected by our diet. So if we, I, here I, I believe we're meant to burn primarily fat as fuel. So we're storing our primary fuel in our fat tissue and we're storing it in the fatty acid profile that we prefer. That all makes sense to me. What we found when we analyzed the ulican grease was that the fatty acid profile of the ulican grease was very similar to human adipose fatty acid. So the brilliance of this ancient uh, culture that figured out without mass spectrometers and laboratories that that one little fish, the fat from that one little fish was the one that most closely uh, resembled the preferred human fat in terms of fatty acid profile. It was this beautiful uh, revelation and it's still being done. Uh, in the past, ulican runs were found in every river from the Aleutian Islands all the way down to California. But now, because of habitat destruction and other things, it's, it's dwindling, but we still have it in northern British Columbia, and it's an annual event. And Ulican Greece, I, I'm in the urban setting, I know, First Nations there, there's kind of an underground economy, like, psst, do you know where I can get some grease, you know? Like, <laughs> people highly value it still. <laughs>